Okay, morning everybody. Um, we're about to start, so um, please take your seats. This morning we're going to be um, moving on to Persane Species Comp and Size Data. And the first uh, presentation is by Tom Peatman, and uh, he's, he's online. Um, Tom, can you share your screen? Uh, good morning, Mark. Yeah, I'll just try and do that now. Okay, great. Yeah, we can see your sp screen. Lovely. I'll just put it onto presentation mode. Can yeah, you? Um, is that come? Is that coming through? Yeah, it's not in full screen though yet, um, and we can hear you too, so that's good. Oh, um, let me. See. It's possibly that I'm sharing the wrong screen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, bear with me. Let me see if I can sort that out. Um, how do I do that? Uh, try that again. Apologies for the delay. There we go. Is that better? That's, that's good. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. Okay, am, am I good to go? Yeah, go for it. Oh, yeah, sorry. Apologies, Mark. Um, yeah, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invite to um, to talk with you today. Hopefully, I'm coming through okay. Um, if not, I have sent the pre-recorded version of the presentation through, so if necessary, we can always move on to that. Um, I just, yeah, first up, want to um, acknowledge the the contributions from the co-authors for the presentation. Um, my my experience on yeah on tuna fisheries is really limited to the to WCPFC, so it's been great to have some input from, from others who have a sort of broader experience from the other RFMOs. Uh, today, I'm hoping to speak for about twenty minutes. Um, and I'll just provide our perspectives on you know what might constitute good practice with respect to per se species and size compositions. Um, and also provide a review of the, the current approaches that are used across the various RFMOs, covering both the way that um, per se species and size compositions are prepared for the assessments, and then a, a bit about how they're actually um, treated within the assessment models. But before going through that, I just wanted to provide a bit of context as to why we have to you know, prepare person catch compositions for the assessment models, why we can't just use the reported catches from vessel log sheets. Um, so they've been known to be um, biased for quite some time. Um, I think as, as a, a general rule, skipjack tends to be over estimated in the vessel log sheets with a sort of under reporting of, of yellowfin and big eye. And you know, why is that? Well, I guess it's difficult for fishers to identify species, particularly when you're talking about the sort of large catch volumes in the person fishery. And there's also often no incentive for the fishers to accurately identify their catch down to a species level. So, so we have to correct the, the species compositions um, before providing them to assessment models to avoid sort of introducing bias. And these corrections impact the catch histories, and they can also impact the catch rates, which has relevance to any sort of per se derived in the seas of abundance. Um, at least in the fisheries I'm familiar with, I think the problem is most problematic for big eye tuna, which contributes a relatively low proportion to the total per se catch, but the per se fishery itself makes quite a substantial or contribution rather to the overall catch of big eye, particularly in recent years. So even a small change in the estimated proportion of big eye um, catch in the person fishery can translate to quite a large difference in the overall catch of, of, of big eye across all of the different gears. And I guess it's not just an issue of bias, it's also an issue of precision for, for big eye too, and that um, when it comes to sampling for species compositions, you need quite high sample sizes in order to obtain precise estimates of catch. Um, for, for big eye. Um, and yeah, in this presentation, we're focusing really on inputs to assessment models, but just wanted to acknowledge that 
these sort of issues are really amplified when you're looking at catch competitions at a finer scale than the assessment model resolution. So, you know, like a fishery of, you know, a region um, combined with a um, set type. So we need uh, independent data sources with which to estimate the sort of species compositions and correct the log sheet compositions for the bias. Um, and yeah, there's a variety of, um, excuse me, there's a variety of um, potential data sources that we can use for that. Um, so there's, in terms of data that's collected on vessels, you've got the at, you know, at sea observers or processing of electronic monitoring footage. And then um, once the um, sort of the, yeah, the catches have been landed, you've got you know, port sampling and potentially canary data as well, you know, final outturns, et cetera. And each of those data sources has its strengths and or weaknesses um, and potential sources of bias too. And in some areas, different approaches might be more um, appropriate or more easy to implement, I suppose, than others, um, depending on, you know, for example, the complexity of supply chains, et cetera, or the levels of observer coverage. And yeah, it's quite hard to get data on person catch compositions, I'd say. Um, you have quite high catch volumes. The braiding process is incredibly fast to try and prevent degradation in quality of the fish. So you can get it, you know, the quicker you can get it to the wells, the better condition it's going to be in. Um, yeah, and there's often complex supply chains in, in the various um, ocean regions. There's also difficulty in obtaining representative um, samples. You have potential layering of fish in the sack, in the brails, in wells. And when I say layering, I mean sort of structure to the size composition or, or the species composition. Um, so that, you know, if you want to obtain a representative sample, you have to sample across the across the entire well, really, rather than just individual part of the well. Um, and yeah, and there's also sampling bias, um, particularly when it comes to observer samples, which we'll be covering off in a little bit more detail in the following slides. And yeah, I, I, another slide is going to quickly acknowledge the sort of impact of COVID on, on data availability in recent years. Um, you know, there's been a reduction in the coverage and sampling rates of port sampling and sampling by observers on board the vessels. And that's going to have an impact on the estimates of species and size compositions. So reduce precision and also potentially introduce um, bias. And you know, I'm aware of work that's going on to explore this further in WCPFC and IATTC and um, possibly elsewhere too. Um, so I guess that's an area to, to watch. Um, Yeah, so moving on to sort of our perspectives on good practices for per se species compositions. I mean, it's an obvious place to start, but you know, when you're estimating the species compositions of per se fishery, you've got to be accounting for the variables that are, that are most influential, and those are uh, commonly you know, set type, you know, the associate, it's a free school set, associated set, and potentially the, the type of associated set, whether it's a you know, drifting fad or set on a log, et cetera. Um, the location uh, and also temporal seasonal variability. So that's point number one. Uh, the second one there is you know monitoring for temporal changes in bias and species compositions. There's um, evidence coming through of you know decrease in bias in the reported catch compositions in recent years in IITTC. So that's important to be monitoring and to be able to um, take into account any changes in in the bias um, through time. Um, I mentioned earlier on about layering of, of, the, of catches, you know, within rails or within potentially within wells. Um, so, you know, we want to have sampling designs that are, that are robust to, to these sort of potential sources of sampling bias. And there may be some bias that, that you can't um, sort of cleverly get around in your sampling design, and we should be correcting that where we can. A good example of that, I suppose, would be grab sample bias in the WCPFC. Yeah, uh, point number four would be you know, considering and ideally testing for the accuracy of species identification to avoid bias uh, creeping in through errors in, um, in the species IDs. Um, 
as I sort of alluded to earlier, um, the particularly for big eye, the you know the, there's likely a reasonable degree of uncertainty in the catch estimates for the for the per sink fisheries, um, and idea you'd want to be accounting for that uncertainty uncertainty within the assessment model um, where where we can. Um, and yes, I also wanted to say that you know length weight relationships are, are often used in the approaches that, um, that, that that generate the estimates for for species compositions across the various RFMOs. And often those relationships, well not often, but they can be based on relatively limited data. And that may not allow us to test or explore the potential for te you know temporal or spatial variation in, in length rate relationships. I suppose uh, you know in an ideal world we'd at least want our length rate relationships to be based on a comprehensive sample from the from the population that's likely to be representative of the of the population as a whole. And, the, and again, there are you know studies going on at the moment um, across at least some of the RFMOs looking at um, better estimates and more detailed estimates of, of length rate relationships. Yeah, I, I'll carry on, Chair. I, I, I'm not sure whether, you, you know, what the state is in terms of taking questions as they come or whether you, you just want me to plow through, but I, I'll carry on um, and assume that unless I'm told to stop, I'm good to continue. Um, yeah, moving on to the size compositions. Um, I know you uh, had uh, Simon Hoyle uh, present the long line size composition um, yesterday. I think a lot, a lot of that material is you know, equally applicable to to, to per sane, um size compositions, but there's, I guess, some per sane specific. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, well, this first data point actually isn't really specific to per se. <laughs> but anyway, the, we should weight our size compositions appropriately for the way that the, for for for, for a fishery and that's appropriate for for where it's actually modelled um, in in the in the assessment model. So if it's an extraction fishery and it's removing essentially removing catch from the population, then we want the size composition and we want to weight it with catch so that we're accurately removing the um, catch at the right, the right sizes. If it's an index fishery, we should weight it using the standardized CPUE, the you know, estimated relative abundance, because if the index fisheries, the size compositions should be you know, informing the size of the, of the underlying population, or the size composition of the underlying population rather. Um, when, we're, when we're talking about weighting, um, so it's a, a simple reweighting procedure can account for imbalanced sampling. When I say simple reweighting procedure, I guess I mean you know using fine scale data, um, weighting the fine scale data by either patch or sunlight CPU, especially to bring it up to a fishery resolution. And that, and that can yeah that can account for imbalanced sampling. But it can't allow you to impute compositions for strata where you're missing samples. Um, on the other hand, this is so spatial temporal modeling um, set out in, in Mark's recent paper, 2020 paper. Um, that does allow you to um, impute for time or areas of the missing data. Obviously, it's a, it's a more computationally expensive approach. And more importantly, I suppose it's more expensive in terms of analyst time. Um, and for some assessments, there, there currently may not be any sort of spatial temporal modeling going on for the per sane size composition. So it might represent quite a sort of a large leap forward, as it were. Um, yes, and, and finally, yes, um, size samples are rarely um, sort of independent. Um, there's correlation within, within sets, within, within wells, within you know, fishing trips, etc. And so the sample sizes should be. Um, set the, the, you know, a level that, the, that accounts for this. Um, and uh, yeah, in the following slides, I'll just briefly provide an overview of the various ways that's done by, by RFMA. Hopefully, I'm still coming through okay. Um, yeah, so now in the following slides, I'll just talk through the various approaches that are used to estimate species compositions by RFMA. So starting off with um, IATTC, um, information on total catch is taken from unloadings data, observer data, and, and vessel logbooks. Um, 
species compositions information is based on on port sampling. As I, as I understand it, the sort of selection for of vessels for the port sampling is largely opportunistic. Um, but when it comes to which wells are sampled, you only sample a well if it represents catch from a single single strata. And the there's sort of like an um, uh, for a, for a sampled well, you alternate sampling between species sampling for species compositions and sampling for size compositions um, as you as you go. So start off and species composition sampling, where it's just targeted number of fish and identifying each of those two to species, then switching to size compositions, measuring length, moving back to size, so species compositions and, and so on. And the, the target sample sizes for, for the for the species and the size composition sampling is is predetermined based on the sort of the numbers of species that are reflected in the well and the, the set type. So for and that's how the samples are obtained. Um, then in terms of how the actual estimates of species compositions are derived. So for thousands onwards, it's a design-based approach. Um, yeah, so strata are defined by year month, by area, I think it's 14. Well, it, may, it probably varies between assessments, but there's, yeah, that sort of order of magnitude of <laughs> numbers of areas um, by set type and by the um, vessel carrying capacity. And for strata where there's no, um, available port sampling data, there's a sort of hierarchical rule-based approach to decide and what substitute strata should be used instead to inform the, um, the species compositions. For the period pre-2000, the species compositions are based on the average from 2000 to 2004. At least that's my understanding of the process, I'm sure the IATTC staff will be able to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Moving on to a more familiar ground for myself, at least this uh, WCPFC. Um, so again, the total catch is taken from the log sheets, uh, and the species compositions are from observer samples, so-called grab samples. Sampling goes on throughout the braiding process, and the observers are um, trying the uh, target number of samples is essentially five fish from each braille, and they're instructed to keep the number of samples constant throughout the braiding process. In terms of per braille. Um, yeah, and there's, uh, yeah, studies have detected bias in, in, in the grab samples, um, where you, whereby you have an underrepresentation of small fish and overrepresentation of large fish in the grab samples. And that then translates into, well, but introduces bias in your length compositions, of course, but it also translates to biased species compositions too. So we correct for that bias. Um, so it's a, it's a length specific correction factors, which are assumed to be species invariant um, based on a sort of lack of information to the, to the contrary. So that's how the samples are obtained in terms of the, how the species compositions are estimated. It depends on the observer coverage for for strata here, strata means a year quarter location set type, and it, I should have also included a flag in there as well. Um, apologies for that omission. Essentially, if you have observer coverage greater than twenty percent for a given strata, the species composition estimates are just based on the on the samples using a you know, design design based approach. For strata with less than twenty percent observer coverage, it's um, uh, the estimates are model based using beta regression models um, that account for set type, spatial and temporal variation flag and the reported compositions. I'll quickly note that we also have independent um, estimates of species compositions for the Japanese per se fleet based on their port sampling and landings receipts data. And that, at least for that, for the Japanese fleet, it provides an independent independent data source with which we can compare our grab sample based estimates with. Um, for IOTC and ICAT, I found, I found it a bit more difficult to track down exactly how the um, compositions are derived for each of the, um, well, for, for, the, for the main fleets. It seems to be a bit more variable between, between the different fleets. 
So here we, um, we'll just briefly summarise the approach used for the EU fleet, which is one of the one of the major fishing fleets um, operating in the regions. Um, so that the yeah the total catches are informed by logbooks with a correction for the total catch um, that's offloaded off the boat at landing. Species compositions are coming from 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 well sampling, um, or port sampling, rather. I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, and of the two main ports in the IOTC region, um, th those account for ninety percent of the total landings events of EU per seiners, and they're sampling from every um, every landing event in those two main ports. The selection for wells is based on a yeah, sampling quality criteria. It takes into account the fishing mode and locations and dates of events um, or sets that have been uh, put into each well. And for a, for a selected well, there's you know random sampling um, of fish that are measured and identified to species. So that generates the that generates the samples, and then there's a model based of well, the soon to be released version of the tuna treatment, tropical tuna treatment process um, uses random forest models um, and accounts for set type, spatial and temporal variation and vessel ID. And I guess the main, one of the main developments compared to the previous approach is it uses fine scale set location rather than sort of an area based approach to taking account of spatial variation. On the right hand side, let's see if I can turn my laser pointer on, gives an idea of the um, the corrections to the composition. They have the dotted T3. Um, shaded um, uncertainty is the updated T3 estimate. There's a link to the GitHub package for those that want to um, look into that in more detail. Apologies, Chair, I'm slightly overrunning here, um, but I'm nearly finished, I think. Um, in terms of how much data are used in the assessment models, as I understand it, the, the models are generally configured to the catches. Um, but the, you know, when it comes to the per -same fisheries, the estimated time periods, whether it be, you know, periods of limited observer or port sampling due to COVID or due to it being at the beginning of the time series where there's less data available. There are also small scale fisheries in the variety of the RFMOs where data collection is, is more challenging. Um, and yeah, ideally we want to be accounting for that uncertainty in some way in the, in the assessment models. last slide now and this is summarizes the treatment of size compositions in assessments by RFMO um, for some of the RFMOs it's the I've sort of summarized what's going on in the preliminary assessments and hopefully it reflects what's going on in the assessment models that are actually used to generate management advice um, so for ICAT and ITC as I understand it, the length samples for each fishery are just essentially aggregated across um, so you know, space and, and fleets. Um, so, you know, to a fishery in near quarter resolution. And the input sample sizes are set based on sampled fish. So in ICAT, sample size is set to the, the logarithm of sampled fish. In IITC, it's um, it's yeah, sample fish, but it's down weighted, um, and there's a maximum initial sample size, which varies between um, different assessments, but it's normally in the region of one to ten. In WCPFC, uh, the size competitions for extraction fisheries are reweighted spatially by catch, 
um, for the extraction fisheries or by estimated relative abundance from the standardized CPUE models for the index fisheries. And the input sample sizes are based on sampled fish. Um, how that sample size is derived depends on the likelihood component that's being used um, in the model. So for the robust normal, um, we apply a proportional reduction in the input sample size, which is um, essentially the proportion of, of catch or relative abundance from sample strata for each fishery. So the, the, the essentially the greater the um, proportion of catch, for example, for an extraction fishery that's from sample strata, the smaller the reduction in the input sample size. Those sample sizes are then captured a, a maximum value and then are further downweighted by a scalar. So that was for the robust normal likelihood component. If you were using the Dirichlet multinomial, then the initial sample size going in is, is unadjusted. Finally, for, for IATTC, um, again, the fishery size compositions are obtained by reweighting spatially by catch for extraction fisheries and relative abundance for the index fisheries. And the input sample sizes are based on the numbers of sampled wells from, from, from the port sampling. And then for skipjack for dolphin sets fisheries, the um, sample size is further downweighted um, due to the low proportion of skipjack catch. And that was taken from, I think, the 2021 preliminary skipjack assessment. Um, yeah. And that's all I wanted to say. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that it's been coming through loud and clear um, your end. And with that, Chair, I'll um, hand it back to you. Thank you. OK, thank you, Tom. Yeah, do we have any questions? Yeah, Nicola. Hi, Tom. Thanks for that great overview. I guess this is a question maybe partially for you, partially for the group. I noticed on your second to last slide, your third bullet um, was about the uncertainty in these uh, species compositions and that it's it's probably difficult to do in practice. Is there any tuna assessment that's trying to account for this across RFMOs? Um, and are there perhaps, uh, I guess, situations where this would be maybe more important to try to account for uh, than others? And I guess the third maybe question is if there are maybe lower hanging fruit to try to quantify some of that uncertainty in terms of propagating uncertainty from the submodels. Um, or the different assumptions that are made in the uh, the species comp allocation process. Thanks. So, Tom, do you have a comment on Nicola's questions? Um, yeah, taking them in turn, um, I'm not aware of any assessment currently that's um, you know, incorporating uncertainty in, in, in the catch compositions or attempting to, um, but that's not to say that there aren't any. So hopefully there'll be someone in the room that can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, my perspective on when it would be most important to do so, I get, well, I think, you know, for the, for the big eye assessments, the you know, if, if, at least if you're looking at the fisheries that I've got direct experience working with in the WCPFC. Um, I, you know, I think the, there is you know, quite a lot of uncertainty in, in the big eye catches at the moment. I, and I should hold my hand up and say I'm the one that's sort of correcting the, the, uh, the species compositions. You know, we don't actually have um, 
estimates on you know quantitative estimates of the uncertainty of, of the catch, which would certainly be a problem. Um, but yeah, so so I think you know I would expect that you know big assessment might be a might be the most sort of well, the assessment that I'd think be most important to, to look at for. But uh, you know that that said, I mean there, there's also the sort of domestic fisheries where um, you know, I don't know how reliable the catch compositions are for those, or even how you'd go about assessing that. And yeah, sorry, Nicola, I actually, um, I think in my haste to write notes down, I didn't quite catch your last um, point, but um, yeah, maybe I'll stop talking anyway and <laughs> hand the floor back to, 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 to Mark. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I guess um, before we go into the next presentation, maybe we should um, give it to the participants. Is anyone in other RFMOs taking into consideration catch uncertainty, um, even even in say historical data or something like that? Yeah, Dan. Um, just quick comments on that regard. The we, we, I mean. The, the catch composition uncertainty from the percent fishery is a, is an issue with IOTC assessment um, recently. We don't have a systematic way of, of you know, account for that uncertainty because we rely on um, countries to provide us with, uh, with those kind of um, catch estimates, particularly for the percent fisheries. The EU use the, the T3 methods to, you know, as, as Tom showed in the presentation to provide those uh, uh, species composition and estimates. But I think last couple of years, some of the countries move away from um, the T3 systems and uh, they kind of use alternative ways or revised methods to come up with those um, estimates. Um, in some cases, for example, the big eye assessment done in 2019, there are, kind of, there are quite a bit of uncertainty in terms of um the revised estimates was kind of quite inconsistent with uh, with the previous years um that kind of is a cause of a concern so the way we deal with it is really ad hoc um it was really done as in an ad hoc basis um basically the scientific committee was kind of um sort of discuss the issue in the meet in the meeting and uh, ask um, you know the secretariat to come up with uh, you know alternative estimates using you know some other sources of information um yeah it's it's we, we really don't have a kind of a structured way to deal with this it's more of a kind of ad hoc way to you know solving this problem thank you thanks dan um anyone else i know i'm pretty sure spc has been doing something. Is John? No, who? Somebody else. We have an online comment. Um, it's Antoine Dupac. Um, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me correctly? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I. This is first time I'm taking the floor, so I'm presenting. Uh, hi, I'm Antoine Dupac. I'm working at IRD, uh, so Sustainable uh, National Research Institute uh, in France, and I'm uh, in charge of statistician uh, uh, work on on species composition, and I, I I'm working uh, on the tropical tuna treatment, so the T3 treatment used by EU fleets uh, to correct the, the species composition. So it is just a, a, a remark uh, regarding the the comment from uh, from Dan. Um, it is true that uh, until now there is the, the the correction on the species composition and the catch uh, declared by by the by the different countries in the CP and the CPCs um, are um, considered. Correct and with no uh, with no 
uh, uncertainty because we are just uh, declared and report to the different RFMOs only uh, one number without a confidence interval. So this is something we are working on and for the next version of the, of the process, we are give we are we have the possibility to give uh, the catch, but also uncertainty around the 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 mean the mean declare of the of the the prediction. So this is a, a remark and also maybe a question for Dan and for every everyone. Uh, does it possible in the model SS3 or another to account for uh, uncertainty on the catch if? The, if the CPCs declare catch with uncertainty, because for now this is not uh, done and this is not possible to to report and to submit uncertainty uh, uh, interval to to the RFMOs. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, does anyone else want to um, talk about whether or not they include the uncertainty in the assessments? I th I thought the um, SPC does something in their, um, was it their, uh, Monte Carlo method? No, no. Yeah, Nicola? I guess if you want to extend to sharks, mm -hmm. um, that's something that's pretty commonly done is mm -hmm. to consider uncertainty in catches. Uh, typically it's, you know, early history. Uh, early time period catches, but I think with management measures changing, it might also be recent catches as well that have uh, uncertainty in it. And I think we discussed this a little bit at the model weighting CAPM um, in November about different ways of incorporate, incorporating uncertainty into the assessment, whether you incorporate multiple alternative catch time series as as fixed without error or you incorporate the catch directly into the assessment with the error um those seem to be two different ways to do it okay yeah thanks um yeah so stock synthesis allows you to i mean you fit to the catch so you have a um, standard deviation that allows you to have different precision on that catch so it's possible um, we can bring this up again if we want to in the discussion period, but I think we should move on to the next presentation. Uh, thanks, Tom. So, Clarity, can you share your screen? Hi, Mark. Yeah, let me see if I can do that successfully here. Okay, morning. Yeah, um, we can hear you okay. nice and clearly. And can you can you also see my screen then? Uh, we I can hope. see your screen, but it's not full screen yet. Yeah, okay. Hang on just a sec. I'm... Uh... Having technical issues. Okay, how's that? That should be hopefully full screen. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Clarity Leonard Cody. I work at IATTC uh, in the Stock Assessment Group for Mogmonder, and I have just a very short presentation on comments on um, the preceding presentation by uh, Tom and all. Um, I just wanted to comment on a couple points um, in Tom's slides. And uh, actually, specifically to layering. Um, and let me see if I can get rid of that, maybe. OK. Uh, so the, the points in Tom's uh, slide on good practices, sampling designs that are robust to potential sources of sampling bias and accounting for uncertainty and catch estimates. And uh, just before giving a couple thoughts, additional thoughts uh, on good practices, I wanted to provide a motivating example, which actually Having watched Tom's presentation, it occurs to me that everyone else but me or us at ITTC may know more about than we do. But anyway, um, hopefully you'll find it interesting. So uh, this example is some preliminary results from a pilot study that we just completed last month. Um, the purpose of the pilot study was to develop a sampling protocol for estimating trip level, not fleet level, but trip level big eye tuna catch. And this arose because in late 2021, the IATTC adopted additional tuna conservation measures, including individual vessel catch limits for big eye tuna. And as part of that, there was to be a, an enhanced port sampling monitoring program to be a source of catch estimation for, um, for at the trip level. 
And if you're interested, the material that's covered in this presentation will be available in documents for a scientific meeting in May in probably about a month or so. So the study, the pilot study that we did had two components. One was among well, and I'm not gonna mention that here. The one I wanted to touch on was the among well component. And uh, that began with data collection for conducting simulations to look into possible sampling designs. We selected trips that had big eye tuna catch and most of the wells that we sampled had catch coming from floating object sets. And we took into consideration area of fishing um, when choosing the wells to, to sample. And I just wanted to point out that neither the wells or the trips um, in this initial, initial data collection phase were, were selected at random. And that's because we had a, actually we had a, a deadline for the pilot study and to start the regular sampling, which is sampling this week, actually. Um, we had a budget already before we even knew what we were going to do. And so we really wanted to conclude the pilot study or at least this intensive data collection phase, having sampled wells that had big eye tuna and having sampled vessels that are contributing uh, a significant amount of big eye tuna to the fleet catch. And if we were concerned that in the short couple of months that we had for the pilot study, should we have done random sampling, we might not have what we would consider to be a representative sample. Anyway, the data collection for the within well sampling was intensive systematic sampling. We exhaustively sampled every 10th unit of fish unloaded from a well, beginning with a randomly selected unit in the first 10 units. And here by unit, I'm referring to either physical units and containers, such as you see here in the, in the photo in the slide, these large blue uh, cylind cylindrical containers. They can be boxes, they can be various shapes. The unloadings that we sampled um, had catch, the entire catch of the well came out through the wellhead. And so the unloading could either be dry as is shown in this figure here, or sometimes flotation was used for part of the unloading. Sometimes when the unloading was dry, it might, for example, when they were opening up space in the wellhead for the unloaders to climb inside, uh, containers weren't used and the fish were handed out one by one. And so in the case of flotation or this one by one dry unloading, we defined uh, virtual containers or virtual units, which was a fixed number of fish. The data that we generated was the species ID and length of every tuna in each one of the selective units. And here is just a cartoon to, or a schematic to try to make this, the, the protocol a little clear. Each rectangle is, is a, an actual physical unit or a virtual unit. Um, the blocks of 10 units are divided by these red lines. If we had selected a random starting point of the second unit, the X's show the sample that we would have gotten, we would have sampled the second unit, the 12th unit, and so on to the end of the unloading. And I just wanted to give you an example of some of the data that we collected. Uh, on the left here, these, these panels show the data from three wells, two different trips. The left columns are the proportion of each of the three tropical tuna species computed for numbers of fish. And on the right, it's a uh, proportion of, of the three species computed from weight, where we took the length data for each fish and used um, a length weight relationship to compute the weight of the fish. The red dots are, the, are for big eye tuna, the proportion big eye tuna in each unit. The green is for yellowfin, the blue is for skipjack. The gray lines that you can see, hopefully, uh, are the number of tunas in each unit. So a triplet of a red point, a green point, and a blue point represents a sampled unit. On the x-axis is a unit number, which is like a proxy for time. So this is the start of the unloading on the left, going all the way to the end of the unloading on the right. Um, and just some points to make is that we encountered a lot, consider, considerable variability in big eye tuna in, in these units over the course of the unloading. It could be high, for example, at the start of the unloading and low towards the end. It could be high in the middle or, or in various places over the unloading. And it could also be low at the beginning of the unloading and high to, higher towards the end. So this large scale pattern was fairly common in the pilot study data. And over here on, on the right, you have uh, a summary of the 71 wells that we sampled for this type of unloading, those came from 42 trips and 37 vessels. Each individual box and whisker plot is a well. 
uh, we sampled anywhere from one to three wells per, uh, per trip. And so if we sampled more than one well, those wells are, are, are presented as contiguous box plots and the same color. The whiskers extend to the uh, extremes of the data. And so what you can see here, uh, the width of the, of the inner, quartile range, inner quartile range, which is the bottom to the top of the colored boxes, um, generally tended to increase the more variability that you get over the course of the unloading of a well in big Ituna proportions. So you can see there's, there's quite a lot of variability over the 71 wells. Um, large scale pattern was fairly common. I'm sure it's due to many factors, but one of the things that we've identified thus far and analysis is still ongoing is that it appears to be related to the number of sets from which catch was unloaded into the well and their, their catch composition. So if there was more than one set from which catch was used to fill the well, um, there was a tendency to have the proportion big I tuna over the course of the unloading be more variable. And this is something that we need to take into account in our within well sampling protocol for estimating trip level uh, big I tuna catch. So just the last slide on this, on this example, <clears throat> um, I wanted to share with you the preliminary sampling protocol that we've come up with. And I wanted to just mention that this was developed um, not only using from simulation studies um, of the well level and, uh, and then uh, among well data that we had, but also there are several reasonable practical constraints. And one of those is that we need a sampling protocol that will not interfere with the normal catch and loading pro process. There was uh, concern that any sampling could possibly lead to catch degradation, could possibly delay unloading and therefore be, have a cost implication for, uh, for the unloading company for the vessel. And so we're trying to design a protocol that doesn't interfere. And also we had a budget actually before we even started the, silo, the pilot program and knew what we were gonna do. So there, there are some limitations. What we've come up with is a two-stage sampling protocol. The first stage, which are wells of a trip, was stratified random sampling. And we are, the goal is to randomly select at least six wells from a dominant catch stratum or catch strata of interest uh, of a trip. And strata are defined by the set type in the area of the fishing. And then the second stage was units of a well and it's systematic sampling from a random start. In particular, we're getting one systematic sample per well and we're exhaustively sampling one out of every 30 units. So in the intensive data collection phase of the pilot study, we were sampling one out of every 10. That proved to be about the maximum that we could do. Um, we had to dial that back for our protocol for the actual enhanced monitoring program. So we're sampling one out of every 30 units, beginning with a randomly selected unit in the first 30 units. So of course we're getting one sample of second in the second stage units. So with the above protocol, we can't estimate the within well variance without collecting additional systematic samples. However, we can produce an estimate of the trip level variance from the first stage big I tuna proportions with the possibility of improvement should resources permit collection of multiple systematic samples per well. In other words, if we could hire additional samplers or dedicate additional samplers to sampling wells, we could end up with second or th and third systematic samples. And a point we wanted to comment is on is that we are attempting to keep the protocol practical to minimize in situ improvisation. We'd like to be able to assume that across sampling teams and trips and vessels that the data were collected in the same way. And we found during the pilot study, the best way to do that is to keep the, the, the protocol as practical as, as we can. So my last slide is just a comment, um, a few comments or suggestions or thoughts or ideas on good practices. The first is that intensive sampling or preferably exhaustive sampling is recommended to generate data with which to identify possible biases and develop method methodology for mitigating them. And just to beat a dead horse, I guess, on the right is an example of our intensive sampling from the pilot study. And I just wanted to point out that, as Tom mentioned, we have a regular port sampling program at IATTC. And the purpose of that program is to estimate the fleet level catch, the species composition of the fleet level catch. If I look at, if I take, translate that protocol into 
the sampling frequency that we see here, it would amount probably to about three of these circles would be what would be sampled given the number of fish in the instructions that are to be collected and the, the way those data are to be collected per the instructions. And so that's a fairly brief, even though it may be a protracted sample, it's fairly it's a fairly brief sample relative to the, the sorts of patterns and species composition that we were seeing over the course of unloading in the pilot study data. Second point is that a pilot study is recommended not only to test sampling protocols, but also to test technology that may simplify data collection. Um, we started out the pilot study using data sheets, pencils recording. We had one sampler and a four person team dedicated to data collection, writing it down. Um, and we're coming into the main program, which starts this week. We'll be using voice recorders for the data collection because it frees up samplers. Um, we're actually going directly to weight instead of length because what we really need from this, this program for estimating the trip level composition of big eye tuna is the weight. Um, and we found that in looking at the pilot study data, there was an indication of rounding. It was like the slides that uh, Simon showed yesterday for the long line data. It wasn't dominant, but it, it was present. Uh, we also have found that being able to weigh the fish allows the samplers to, to get into a better rhythm for sampling and that, and that therefore uh, allows us hopefully to collect data uh, with fewer samplers per well and therefore sample more wells and, and more trips. And then also during the pilot study, we made extensive use of GoPros for seeing how, sam how the, the samplers were in implementing the pro protocol, what problems they might have to be able to check their species identifications, for them to be able to communicate back to us uh, ideas on, on improvements. It was invaluable given that we were doing this long distance, this, the sampling took place in Ecuador. Um, and we may use GoPros in the, in the main program as well, just because it's, a, it's a, means, a great means of communication and sharing ideas. And finally, the last comment is that when implementing a two-stage sampling protocol, with limited resources, it seems useful, useful that the protocol allows design-based estimation of a first stage variance with available resources, but can accommodate second stage variance estimation with little modification. Um, and I know a number of people have talked about doing model-based estimates of fleet level catch, and that's great. I think in our case, we want to be able to fall back on a, a design-based approach for, for a variance if we need it. Um, and this was, I think, made clear to me when we, as Tom mentioned, when the pandemic hit and we were all impacted with, with uh, problems with data collection, when it's opportunistic, it can be difficult to figure out what you might have got had you had a, you know, had there not been a, a pandemic and not to say that we expect pandemics all the time, but simply having some structure to the sampling, I think is beneficial even if in the end, you may take a different approach to estimation. And with that, um, take any questions and turn the floor back over to, to Mark. Thanks, Clarity. Um, any questions for Clarity? Screw up my screen. No. Okay, so um, we, we can still, uh, we'll move on to the discussion session, but um, you can ask questions for either Clarity or for Tom in this. So if you have a question for Clarity that you think about, uh, please bring it up. Um, so anyone got a question to start off? No. So I've got a question, could be for anyone. Um, so this is related to data weighting. Um, one theory behind data weighting is that you estimate your effective, uh, your sample size or effective sample size from the data itself. So it represents the sampling variability rather than any other uh, variability included in the model, like um, mis misspecification or unmodeled process variation. So is there anyone out there that's actually been estimating the effective sample size from the data itself outside the stock assessment model rather than trying to estimate the effective sample size inside the stock assessment model?
Ja, ja. Ah, yes, Heiko. Uh, just to share, just to share an ex uh, experience with uh, uh, dolphin associated pursuing fishery. So, uh, several years ago, I I used a vase to build a, a land specific spherical temporal model because vase can use the variance in that combination to compute the uh, input sample size based on based on data itself, and I compare that estimated sample size with the number of wells sampled, so the, the value, the input sample that we use, and I found that they, they show very similar temporal trend. Yeah, and, and using, for, that is just one case study, but using the number of wells sampled in the model and use, uh, and use or using the uh, sample, input sample size estimated by VAST, Gets very similar results in the stock assessment, but yeah, that is just one case study. Yeah, Nicholas. Yeah, just had a quick follow up. You mentioned it. The, the two methods made similar trends through time. What was the magnitude of the sampling error uh, similar? Uh, no, they are very different. But uh, in the stock assessment, the scholar we will scale them to a very similar value. The effective sample size is similar, but one is number of wells, wells sampled, another is uh, the input sample size, like number of, number of fish samples. So they have very different uh, scale, but within as has or within a stock assessment, they will be scaled by two, it will be scaled to effective sample size and the effective sample size based on either of them are similar. So are you are you then further downweighting within the assessment? Uh, yeah. So the input sample size is only based on the variance in the competition data, but we all models are wrong. So there's pro, a large model misspecification and uncounted uh, process error. So it need to be further downweighted within the stock size model from input sample size to effective sample size. Yeah, thanks, Haikun. Um, yeah, Dan? Yeah, just share a little bit experience. Um, we haven't done much. I don't, I don't think I've done anything in terms of estimating um, sample size for the tuna assessment, but in my previous experience, we used to sort of um, ha has a methods to come up with initial sample size uh, for the composition data, the way we do it is that because those samples come from, a, if the samples come from kind of stratify sampling program, you kind of have, you, you have a, using a bootstrap approach to sort of uh, come up with uh, CV estimates for, you know, for your um, size frequency or, or age frequency for those samples. And if you use a multinomial distribution for in, in, in your model, there's a, generally there's a relationship um, between the sample size and the CV. So from your bootstrap CV, you can come up with, uh, with the estimates of your, of your sample size. We tend to use that as an initial sample size. So that kind of give you the relative weighting for um, your composition data in the model. And from there onwards, you use, uh, you know, can use the Francis methods to kind of um, better adjust them. Um, yeah, but I think in the end, it's really the final sample size that matters in terms in, in assessment model. So um, the relative sample size, um, which you get from that approach doesn't seem to play a, a, a major, makes a major difference. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, any other comments on that subject? No. Okay, any other topics that anyone wants to bring up? Yeah, Simon. Yeah, um, I was just wondering about um, extrapolating back to some of the early periods where you don't have 
good sampling data. Um, I, I did some analyses of species comp data when I was at WCPFC and looking at both the observer data and the, um, the fishery data, the reported species compositions, and there were obvious biases in the reported species compositions, but they also had some similarities and you could estimate similar interannual variation and spatial variation but there were biases in the ways they were reporting um, big eye um, in particular. But I'm just wondering if there's potential in those data to extrapolate back to catches in previous and earlier periods where you don't have the sampling, um, the good quality sampling. Thanks, Simon. So does anyone from the RFMOs um, have a method for determining the historical species comp that maybe adjusts what's reported based on comparisons like Simon was talking about? No. How, how uncertain is that historical catch? I mean, I know that the IATTC is using an, um, some average average was from um, when the when the sampling program began to try and adjust those um, species comps. But what about other RFMOs? What do they do? Do they just take it as reported, or are they trying to address for the biases? Yeah, Dan. <laughs> I don't think I can answer that question, but I to say, I mean, we use re pretty much use reported um, catch. There's actually a big controversy since we have that issue with uh, with uh, you know the revised EU catches. Once they revise uh, the move away from the T3 methods, come up with the revised uh, person catches. Um, I mean, the scientific committee has concern with those estimates. So in assessment, we kind of use alternative estimates, but we cannot really replace those catch estimates as a facial, est uh, a facial estimate, catch estimates in our database. So that's still an ongoing debate what we do with those revised catches. I mean, supposed to be the country provide us with, uh, with estimate. Um, but for the early catches, we just have to use what's been provided. And also for the percent fisheries, just one component of our, of our catches. We have so many other fleets. Um, but... Okay. Um, yes, we have one online. Tom, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, uh, thanks, Mark. I was just going to say in, um, in the WCPFC, so when we're estimating species compositions for the years pre-2007, we use the model-based estimates um, and fix the year effect to 2007, um, which, um, yeah. And, and that, that was changed back in 2018, I think. And that, I think, um, Previously, there was a separate model that was used for the early time period, which didn't incorporate temporal effects in the, in the model. And making that sh change did sort of reduce or remove like discontinuities in the estimated species compositions when you move from one model structure to another, as it were. But yeah, obviously there's, um, there are sort of uncertainties when you're sort of extrapolating back through time. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there, but that, that's sort of the WCPFC um, approach. So, so remind us what was in your model-based estimator? Was it, it was area and season or something like that? And gear type? Yeah, so it's, um, yeah, there's sp spatial effects, um, so a combination of uh, like longitude, um, Yeah, a separate longitude spline um, is an archipelagic zone effect. Um, 
and then yeah um uh, temporal effects and for the f associated sets there's like a um set yeah associated set type so anchor fed drift fed etc um yeah yeah thanks tom so any other comments on that topic no. okay um move on to a, a different topic anyone got a, another topic that they want to bring up no um so is how many how many rfmos are using um model-based approaches to do the um species and and length comp um estimates as opposed to design based is, is anyone using like spatial temporal models like vast to fill in the holes in terms of spatial as uh, in terms of species distributions or um species yeah uh, proportions or size distributions yeah dan um simple answer is no we generally just use uh, the raw data even not not even a design based approach we simply use raw data um but we did had a go at some stage try to use the model based approach but what we use is something that a uh, field developed for some of some of his work um i, I think he used the dirichlet multinomial uh kind of to account for some kind of spatial variability in the samples to come up with the underlying distribution we we we, we had a go with that uh to derive the um composition data for the standardize the composition data for the long line fisheries. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done because that I think that method simply counts for the spatial variability, but there's a lot of other variabilities that needs to be to be accounted for. But anyway, we had I think that's a good experience. Thanks, Dan. Um, anything else? Uh, Hey, Mark. Yeah, Carolina. Oh, uh, Clarity, yeah. Sorry, I'm having trouble figuring out how to raise my hand here in <laughs> Zoom, sorry. I just wanted to comment on the species composition. And I, again, maybe this may just be my learning that makes it seem of interest, but um, before we started the pilot study, I sort of always said, well, species ID was a problem because that's what I, I had been told. And having completed the pilot study, it seems, at least for us and I, in EPO, it's a little more subtle than that, or a little more nuanced, I should say. I'm sure that species ID is a, is a problem. In other words, if you had three, one fish of each species on a table, could anyone, could the observer or the, the fisherman tell them apart? I mean, I couldn't. But so that being strictly speaking, species ID. And then in our case, there's a question of quantities that the observers, we have high observer coverage, the observers, may be able to identify individual fish to species, no problem, but estimating the quantity may be the, more of the challenge. And actually in the data that we can, collected from the pilot study, we have the intensive sampling and the observer estimates for a well of the catch composition or the proportion big I tuna are actually fairly highly correlated with the um, intensive sampling. I mean, there's, yes, there's a lot of variability, but the correlation coefficient is about 0.8. But when you start to look at it, data from individual observers and we were able to, or individual trips, and we were able to do this in the last part of the pilot study because we tested the protocol that I showed in the slide. And so we had five or six wells sampled per trip and we can compare the estimates between what we got from the sampling protocol and what, for example, the observer would have provided as their initial estimates in, their, in their, the data of the report before the end of the trip. And some observers, there were really good Correlation. I mean, I mean, really good. And other observers, for example, in some cases, had an estimates that were well below the the sampling estimates. And so it's this individual variability, and it it raised in my mind the the, the question of whether or not, in some cases, data can be used to calibrate observers or calibrate vessels. Anyway, I just throw that out there. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Clarity. Um... Yeah, Carolina. Uh, 
So uh, my question will be, what will be the, the recommendation for the time when we didn't have this sampling of species ID? So for now we use uh, like an, an average for a certain period, uh, but should we like um, have different scenarios or have an idea of how much the catches bef before that period might be uh, uncertain or something like that or just go with the, the best we can do the best system has anyone got any suggestions on that no okay any other questions i've i've got a question so the the work that clarity showed was that if you put multiple sets in a well, even if they come from the same area and the same set type, you can get quite big differences in the proportions by species, particularly big eye tuna. Um, so obviously, um, well, not obviously, um, we assume that that's because different sets catch different proportions of big eye. So it might be better to actually sample the sets. Obviously you can't do that at the port by well because they're all mixed in there but if you do it if you do the sampling on board the vessel uh, like they do in the western central pacific then you're sampling each set so you you're missing that um, issue the question is whether or not it's feasible to do that sampling on board vessels um and avoid biases like the grab sampling bias now the question is does anyone else any other tuna rfmos do the same type of onboard sampling by observers and and how do they they do it <laughs> dan do you do, do you, are, you, are you getting yours no, from observers or port samplers no for the for the for the person fishery we have the same system as uh, as as iittc we do port sampling for the um they have observers but i don't think the observers are doing any sampling on board but in terms of the problem you raised of have multiple sets in in the well and for us, it's more of a problem because we have these two fish modes of, you know, the vessels fishing on free school and fishing on fats, and they get quite different uh, lens composition data. If the whales um, have sets that come from those two different type of school, that's really going to mess up your, your um, uh, composition estimates or lens composition estimates. So when I talk to people over there, they, I, I think what they do is they try to, uh, from the well plan, they try to identify those, those, those wells that have multiple, not multiple sets, but they have samples come from different type of uh, fishing modes. They can identify that, and then they try to avoid sampling from those wells. That, that's what they try to do. Yeah, so we have a online comment from Antoine. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, this is not me, this is my colleague that is in charge of the observer program, but I can answer to you about what, if it's about the feasibility of sampling uh, on on uh, on board uh, during the, the fishing. Um, the big issue we have, it's the the speed of the of the brailing and the amount of fish is, is just uh, huge. So, um this is in theory theoretically this is feasible but but with a teams of at least i think uh three or four people and the, currently there is no um no 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 space for for a, a big team in the per sainer because there is, there is, there is, there is um, the crew members that are, are using um, all, the, all the space. So we have only one observer and the the observer in ICAT and in the IOTC uh, area for, for the persainer are, are um, focused on discard and, uh, and sensitive species in priority. So 
uh, we have not the space for 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 doing it for now. But and as we have uh, the, the the chance to have very main ports that uh, concentrate the major uh, majority of the landings, this is easier for for the for the sampling to to focus on the on the main ports. That's the reason why we 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 are doing this. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any other comments? Someone online. Um, yeah, um, thanks. Tom, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> thanks, Mark. Yeah, just to quickly note that there's been some attempts to you know look at electronic monitoring as a means of providing um, species and size samples on um, on a per se in a, operating in the Central Pacific. I think uh, I forget now which scientific committee the report went to, but um, yeah. So essentially, you know, having cameras over over conveyor belts and and sampling fish as as they're speeding past, um, which I think yeah, there's a number of issues that that need to be sort of overcome with that in terms of how you can control the speed of your fish going on the conveyor belt and you know whether you have, might have layering on your conveyor belt in the same way that you have layering in in you know in in your brails etc like do you have do, do smaller fish tend to be obscured by larger fish or you know the smaller fish tending to sit on top of a conveyor belt or whatever um anyway but there's yeah, there's, there's work going on there um which yeah might provide a means in the future of getting sort of on board um sampling you know in large numbers efficiently okay thanks tom um in relation to this um someone brought up a point just earlier and in terms of the iattc and this is a question for clarity maybe is that the iattc observers report um, catch by species in small, medium, and large categories. And I was wondering if they had that available by Braille for a particular set, um, and you knew which sets went into a well, um, you could at least identify which wells you might expect to have a differing species comp um, by set, and then you would want to sample those sort of more rigorously or something like that. Is is that something that's possible in the IATTC? Um, okay, uh, yeah, <laughs> a couple of things. That I'm not, a, that I'm aware we don't have rail level data like that. In fact, actually, we don't, the well map data that Dan mentioned, um, we don't actually even key punch those sort of data for all for ITTC trips, although they are, are key punch for national program trips. And it wasn't until last fall when we were doing the pilot sampling that we, the realization that we could actually try to recreate those well plan data. And we needed that because we didn't feel we had enough resources in the pilot study to, to sample lots of wells from a trip. Um, so I think the well plan data where, where we have the observer, when there's an observer on board, the observer records the sets, the amount of tuna catch that goes into each well from, e from each set. Um, those data we can recreate, but I think at a braille level, it would, it would be difficult. And just to kind of touch back on Dan's comment and then finish up on, on your question mark, um, in the pilot study, we did not sample wells with mixed set types. Uh, that would definitely be a problem. And we did in, we did f decide which wells to sample best based on this well-planned data, or we call it a set summary data, or resume and Delance's data, um, that tells which how much of each species went into the well from each set type per the observer's estimates. Um, yeah, and so sampling wells that are mixed set type is a problem. And that's actually an interesting, a little, a subtle little interesting subtle detail because you're trying to sample perhaps as many wells as you want of the catch strata that you think are really gonna produce big eye tuna. So you wanna sample floating object sets and you, in our case, we wanna sample them in the Western part of our, our management area. Um, 
And as long as you don't have a lot of wells with mixed set types or mixed areas, that works out great. And when you have these mixed, these wells with mixed set types and mi mixed areas, it limits how much you can sample, um, which is sort of a, can be a bit of a pickle. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it, from the preliminary work that we've done, the variability that we saw relates to the catch composition when you have, for example, three wells that go, or three sets that go into the well. And um, the first set had a lot of big I tuna. When you look at the, the our, our data, our intensive sampling data, there's a lot of big I, proportion of big I tuna that comes out at the beginning of the unloading, which would be about where the last set was. And there's and if, if the other sets didn't have any big I tuna, there tends to be no big I tuna at the end. So it does seem to relate to catch composition. Um, I suppose you could, well, my hope, because this pilot study has raised a concern about our regular port sampling for estimating fleet level catch. And so we plan to do simulation studies to try to evaluate if this pattern that we've seen in the pilot study is causing us a problem in particular because where wells are sampled during that program is opportunistic when people arrive to the, the, the port. Um, there's just not a lot of plan structure, uh, even though wells of mixed set types, mixed strata are not sampled. Um, so in principle, we could use the preliminary data provided by observers to try to refine the sampling or structure the sampling, looking to see how many sets went into a well, looking to see if they're a mixed set type, that sort of thing. Um, and that's done to some extent in the, in the regular port sampling for the trip level, or excuse me, for the fleet level estimation, because we don't sample wells with catch from mixed strata. Um, we could do it um, for the, our trip level sampling and, but, I think when you start to look at mixed sets, there's, there's a question of how independent you want your data sources to be, in my, to my mind at least. In other words, if, if we start structuring the sampling, whether it's for trip level or fleet level cache estimation, according to how many sets went into the well, even if it's not mixed stratum, if you're, if you're then looking to see if it was one set or multiple sets and what the composition was, I become concerned about about losing independence in the in the in our data sources and therefore in our estimates of, of of catch composition. So I guess my personal opinion would be that it wouldn't be something I would be inclined to put a lot of weight on. But uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm being particularly myopic on that. Okay. Thanks, Clarity. So any other comments, uh, Paul? Yeah. Um. It's very hard to see that we can fix a lot of this uncertainty. I mean, we deal with fleets in Indonesia and in the Philippines and, and their challenges of collecting data on catch are, are huge in terms of resourcing and the amount of ports and the things that they have to cover. And, and they just have uncertainty in resource from year to year on, and the, the variation in their sampling intensity is, is big. Um, I guess in the long line fleets, what seems to be coming our way is traceability and catch documentation schemes. And so um, if, the, if these become adopted by, by the main industries, then you know they should be reporting their catch to species almost perfectly um, to satisfy those requirements. So there's a few countries in the Pacific now looking at trialing catch documentation schemes. So that, that's probably gonna help a lot with long line fisheries in the future, and particularly for species like Big eye, which have perhaps more pressure on them through accreditation schemes and other and other things to document catch more accurately. I wonder if we're part of the problem here because I'm I'm interested to know if people have presented assessments at SCs and commission level where they've incorporated reasonably plausible levels of catch uncertainty and and how those were were taken by by those groups because it seems like they just accept that the catch we put into the models is accurate and um, what comes out is is also representative. So if we're asked, we, we're starting to get asked to incorporate catch uncertainty maybe for some of the areas and fisheries that, that we know are really uncertain, but it's, it's a bit like effort creep too, I suppose we get asked about that, but what, what are the plausible ranges of uncertainty that we should be included in and how do we, you know, come up with those, I think, is a, is a question I'm thinking about in terms of some of the issues we've got with catch uncertainty. So it's, yeah, it's certainly if anyone's had experience presenting assessments, incorporating this uncertainty into their 
into their grids or whatever and how was it received? So does anyone want to answer Paul's question? Yeah, for good son. Yeah, uh, about the uh, is the microphone. Okay, uh, about the uh, uh, yeah previous uh, issue raised. Uh, uh, I'm 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 uh, one of the uh, 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 I'm from the uh, briefing working group of the ESC and uh, conducting a briefing assessment, and uh, uh, we. <laughs> We have some sort of uncertainty in the catch and uh, have some uh, sensitivity analysis. And uh, as well as that, uh, we are conducting uh, ASPM uh, diagnostics uh, to check the net effect of the catch and the uh, natural mortality and growth and the recruitment to, uh, to check the uh, consistency between the uh, productivity assumptions and the uh, data. So uh, I don't know if this uh, solves uh, all the issue about the uh, catch uncertainty, but we can check the consistency between our data and the uh, uh, productivity assumption. Yeah. Yeah, we have Matt Vincent online. Hi, Mark. Um, thanks. Yeah, I was going to respond to Paul's comment. Um, it's not necessarily tuna related, but in the Southeast Atlantic, we have a lot of uncertainty in our catch uh, from the recreational fisheries. And so the way that we deal with that is through an ensemble approach where we resample our catch data. And usually we have estimates of some sort of standard error. Usually it's based on the model that's used to estimate the uh, recreational catch based on uh, we're provided some CV and so we resample based on that CV and then refit our data in the model ensemble. Um, our model ensemble is like 4,000 models that we do this re resampling, which I realize WCPFC definitely won't be able to do given their long run times. But I think you could do a similar thing where you resample your data given your uncertainty um, in your catch and supposedly you could even resample from your um what resample from the the species composition data in order to give you those estimates um, and then plug that into your assessment okay thanks matt i think that was probably the analysis i was remembering <laughs> um related to this one thing that we did in the iattc was that um if most people probably can remember because it's similar in other um, oceans as well that when the persane fisheries expanded um the indices of abundance on the long line didn't decline as much and so basically the models had to increase recruitment to um to basically make up for that increased catch in uh, small fish in the persane fisheries and so one assumption was that we were um, there was misreporting of big eye tuna, so they were actually catching a lot more big eye tuna than than what we thought, particularly historically. And so that was one thing that we tried was to try and um, increase the historical catch of big eye tuna, but it had to increase by a huge amount to make get rid of that uh, recruitment pattern. So it didn't seem like that was the problem. Um, but that was one thing we tried about uncertainty in catch. Okay, any other comments on uh, per se link frequency and species composition? If not, and I don't see it on online, I think we should might as well break. Um, and we'll come back at half past 10 uh, to start on recording.